Hey, this is Leach with Simpson Math, and in this video, we'll be talking about function notation. Now, before we get to the notation part, let me remind you about a function. But before we get that, we have to talk about relations. So a relation is a set of x and y ordered pairs. When you think relation, think relationship. There's nothing really special going on. It's just that this x is paired with that y, this x paired with that y, so on and so forth. Um, you can see these as a list of points. You can make a graph out of them. You can have uh, maybe even equations. It's just a set of x and y ordered pairs. But then a function, that is a specific or a special set of, of relations. You might recall a previous uh, instructor talking about the vertical line test. If I can draw a vertical line through a relation, then that means that that relation is a function. It means that their relationships, uh, the relation between x and y, it is functioning properly. It's working well. When I plug in an x, only one y comes out. An example of a, of a function system I like to think about are telephone numbers. When I dial a number on the phone, it's only going to go to one destination. Now that destination might have multiple numbers arriving there. That's fine. Um, it's all about when I dial one specific number, it's going to end up at one specific ending point. So that's a function. Now in terms of math, again, we can express them as a list of points, an equation, a graph. So this particular equation right here is a function. So we reserve a very special notation, a way to, a set of symbols. Um, when we have a function, we call, um, instead of just writing y equals, we'll write it as f of x. Now this f of x does a few things for us. One, it just simply tells us that this is a function. So if you ever see f of x, later in these notes you'll see g of x. In the next video you'll see k of x. So anything of x, this tells us that this is a function. Now understanding function notation is very helpful not just in college algebra um, but in but in many other maths including even statistics and other things uh, there's function notation shows up there even though it's not these types of graphs or points the idea is just that you plug in one thing and a specific certain thing comes out every time so the main focus today is we're going to then be using this function notation it's not just about oh cool we have this way of writing it it's just another way of writing why it's more than that. So a function notation is a special way of us defining that this equation is a function. Uh, it also casually also lets us know that, oops, I erased. <laughs> it also lets us know, uh, gives us a name of this function. This particular function is function f. Like I said, later in these notes, you'll see g of x. We'll just call that function g. It just helps us distinguish between two different sets, uh, two, three different uh, equations. So whatever letter is there, that's the name of that function. But most important is what we can do with this. So we have this function. This is f of x. The input is x. We also see that input over here uh, as this x. And then once, we, once this simplifies, it would produce an output. And that output is basically really f of x or the y value. So um, Functions are all about inputs and outputs. So if we take a look at, uh, let's find out what f of 1 is. All right, so notice what's happened. I have this f of x, but instead of it being f of x, it's now f of 1. So what has changed between f of x and f of, oh, missed it, f of 1? Well, f of x, is no, well, it's no longer an x, it's now a 1. So we're going to do that exact same thing when we evaluate, right? So I have this negative 2x plus 5. So if I'm going to be evaluating an f of 1, instead of writing an x, I'm going to just write a 1 in its place. This is just a fancy way of in symbols saying, hey, if x is 1, what's y? That's really all that this says is, hey, when x is 1, what's y? So when x is 1, I plug in a 1. Negative 2 times 1 is negative 2. Negative 2 plus 5 is 3. So that tells me, hey, what when x is 1, what's y? Well, what that's that's basically an ordered pair here. So I could write this as 1, comma 3. When x is 1, y is 3. So over here on the right hand side I have a little graph going. So that means when x is 1, my y is 3. 
So I have a dot right there on my function so far. All right, so what happens if I plug in zero? So if I have f of zero, when x is zero, what's the y? So when x is zero, negative uh, two times zero is zero, zero plus five is five. So when I plug in zero, out pops five. Let's look at that over on the graph. That means I have an ordered pair at zero, five. So my x is zero, go up one, two, three, four, five, and I have this point. Notice what is special about this point. This point is on the y-axis. It is what we call the y-intercept. Super special about functions is that we are always, not sorry, always, if we have a y-intercept, we're only going to have one y-intercept. So we can either have zero or one y-intercept. If it's a function, I will never have more than one y-intercept, like two or three, because if I had a graph and it did this, now it crossed over the, uh, the y-axis twice. That's a problem. That is not a function. So we have our y-intercept here. Um, and it's always going to be the case that if henceforth throughout this entire course, this course is basically a study of functions. If I plug in a zero, sorry, rewind, throughout this course, if I want to know what a y-intercept is, all I need to do is just plug in zero for x. Plug in zero, out's going to pop the, the y, which will be the y-intercept. All right, so let's take a look at C. Evaluate f of five halves. So I'm going to plug in five halves where the x is, and now I'm going to multiply. Negative, this negative two, you can think of this negative two as negative two over one. Um, but I could think of this as negative 10 divided by two, and then reduce that and get the negative five. But it'd be easier just to go ahead and reduce the twos, and then we'll be left with negative five. So negative five plus five is zero. So I have an ordered pair at five halves zero. So let's look at that over here on the graph. So if I have an ordered pair at five halves, that's two and a half. Um, if I have an ordered pair at five halves zero, no, notice what is special about the point here. Well, that's an x-intercept. So finding x-intercepts is gonna be a big focus in this course. Now it's not as easy as just plugging in zero and seeing what comes out. But um, it is basically, uh, it's a little bit trickier because the math isn't as simple, but we're gonna be setting the y, setting the output to zero, and then having to do solving and manipulation. Um, so it wasn't an accident that, that, that I got uh, zero here, that was the point here, but we'll get to it later in this course. Uh, we'll talk about how to find those x-intercept. That's a, that's a big topic. All right, so, um, we get this idea of function notation. Um, it's just a fancy way of saying, hey, if this is x, what's y? All right, so let's look at another function. All right, let's take a look at g of x. Now, this g of x, there is nothing special about it being g. It's just literally the next letter in the alphabet, f, g, all right? It's still a function, so f of x, g of x, k of x, q of x, a of x, whatever of x, that's going to be uh, a function. So g of x, and, and now this is a quadratic, 2x squared minus 3x plus 1. I know it's a quadratic because it's a, it's a polynomial, um, and the leading coefficients uh, exponent, so the degree, the largest exponent is 2. Talk more about that much later, but that is a bit prerequisite knowledge, knowing that this is a quadratic. All right, so let's evaluate it. So I'm going to evaluate g of 1. So this is g of x. What has changed between g of x and g of 1? Well, only the 1. So that means wherever you see an x, so I see an x right here, and I see an x right here, I'm going to replace those with 1s. And that's what I've done here. So now we have 1s right here. Now let's talk about the order of simplifying this. We call this the order of operations. So over here on the side, uh, I have this thing called that I refer to as gimma. You might be like, whoa, 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 Mr. Leach, I've been taught that order of operations is PEMDAS. Yes, 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 that's fine. But in my opinion, sometimes students mix up or have a hard time with PEMDAS for uh, one specific set of reasons. And they don't understand that multiplication and division are very, very similar. Um, if I was to say divide by two, so something divide by two, 
That's the same thing as saying something multiplied by one half, right? You give me anything that's division, I can turn, turn it into multiplication. Anything that's multiplication, I can turn it into division. Same thing with addition and subtraction, right? Uh, if I had something minus two, well, that's the same thing as something plus a negative two, all right? Any addition, I can turn it into a subtraction. Now, they are go, uh, subtracting and dividing are going in opposite directions of adding and multiplying, but they're the same hierarchy. So that's why I like gimma, grouping, exponents, multiplication, and addition. When I say grouping, I'm talking about parentheses or even square brackets. Some students have a hard time uh, with these square brackets, but sometimes um, I like square brackets better. Um, but also, if, I'm, if I've already used parentheses and I want another set of grouping, sometimes the square brackets are nice because it um, just provides a little bit of more visual clarity. So parentheses, square brackets, same difference in terms of um, solving equations or simplifying. Later, we'll talk about integral notations and square brackets and parentheses have slightly different meanings there. But in order of operations, same thing. Exponents are exponents, uh, as you know. Uh, but then just this idea that multiplication, division, they are at the same hierarchy. Um, and then if you're ever a tie, so if you see a multiplication and a division symbol, you don't know which one to do first, work left or right if there aren't any other grouping symbols. You, you've probably seen the, um, the memes that get, that get spread around social media of your mom or aunt or first cousin twice removed being like, bet you can't solve this, and it just being this annoying, weird, weird math thing. It's probably some division that's in a weird spot and people assuming that that division is, is messing with other things. If you ever see any fun ones, feel free to pass them my way and I'll, I'll help you out with them. So I think of Gamma, but if you're going to do with PEMDAS, if you want to think PEMDAS, because that's what you've learned since third or fourth grade, just know that multiplication uh, and division are paired together, addition and subtraction paired together. If it's a tie, work left or right. All right, so with that covered, uh, now let's simplify this. So inside parentheses, nothing to do. There's just ones there. Uh, but it is important that you notice that I'm using, I'm putting my uh, substitution inside parentheses. Not that big of a deal when it's just these ones, but when we get to negatives, <coughs> oh, pardon me. Oh, oh, you'll be doing this one on your own. Oh yeah, that's, that's a negative. So uh, be ready for that. So whenever you're plugging, um, whenever you're plugging things in, especially when they're, <coughs> negatives it's a good idea to put parentheses around that so that way um you don't mess things up as much uh, it keeps it keeps it contained uh, you're going to be a lot more successful with these parentheses later also we'll be adding things it'll be like an x plus three and that goes in the parentheses so you want to keep all that together so then the next uh thing is the exponent so let's square the one well one squared is just one so well that's just one and then now let's see with the multiplication two times one is two and negative three times one is negative three. That sign stays with those numbers. So now let's just add or subtract. Two minus three plus one ends up being zero. So when x is one, y is zero. So we have an ordered pair at one, zero. I'm not worrying about graphing this, but this would be uh, an x-intercept, right? So using order of operations, I would like for you to evaluate g of two. So pause the video and try this on your own. I'm zooming out so that way you can see the G function. There you go. Pause the video, try this on your own. All right, welcome back. Let's see how you did. So we have G of negative two and I'm replacing the X's with negative two. Notice I put parentheses around my X's. Why is that an important idea? Well, because if you, um, with that negative two, it is negative two squared. If you don't write uh, parentheses around that negative 2 and you square this per order of operations this is negative 2 times 2 which is a negative 4 that is not right all right um, the, it is negative 2 squared which is negative 2 times negative 2 and a negative times a negative is a positive so it's a positive 4 all right so it is not just, oh, it's convenient. It is mathematically incorrect to say this, all right? So make sure we put parentheses around our substitutions. So negative two squared is positive four. 
Also, order of operations is important here. I've seen many a student um, multiply and then square. You, exponents beat multiplication, and the most the time that's the most tempting is here, right? They want to go. Oh well, this is negative four. Uh, negative four squared uh, is then positive sixteen, and then they're and then now they're way off. That is a big big no no. So we square first, all right? Then we multiply. Two times four is eight. A negative six times a negative two is a sorry misspoke. Negative three times a negative two is a positive six. So then we add those up and we end up that g of negative 2 is 15. So that means if I plug in a negative 2, out's going to pop a positive 15. So negative 2, 15 would be that ordered pair. All right, I want you to, to try to do this one on your own. Oh, fractions, I know how evil I am. Um, I do have a fraction review video, so you might want to go check that out um, to uh, make sure that you are good with adding and multiplying fractions here. So. Um, I've replaced the uh, x's with one-thirds, and now I'm squaring and multiplying them. So if I square a fraction, remember from our fraction review video that we, uh, oops, need the square, that we just square the top, square the bottom. So I have one squared over three squared. One squared is one, three squared is nine, and so we end up with one, one-third squared is one-ninth, and that's what we have here. Another way of thinking about that is that it's just one-third times one-third, and then we just multiply across. One times one is one, three times three is nine, which is the same thing as that squaring. Um, so then uh, we just multiply. Again, we have this is two over one, so it's two times one is two for my numerator. One times uh, nine is nine, so we have two-ninths here. And then again, three over one, but I can just reduce those threes. So the threes reduce to one, and I'm left with one times one over one times one, or just one. Oh, actually, this boat forgot that negative. This is a negative three, so it's a negative one times one over one times one. So then minus one, and this one has just followed us down. Uh, negative one plus one is zero, leaving two ninths. Lucky you, you didn't have to add fractions. All right, so that means if I plug in a one third, out's going to pop a two ninths. All right, real fast, one last one to try on your own. I know this is different. I'm just curious. I wish I had feedback so, could, so you could tell me what you get from this, but it's important. I want you to try to do this one on your own. All right, let me scroll up just a bit so that we can sort of see what the G function looks like. Uh, so I want you to do, do this one on your own. This is G of A. That's not a 9. That's just an A. So G of A, see what you get. All right, welcome back. I was trying to trick you a little bit. I had a bigger box than I needed. All it is is just I'm going to replace all of my x's with a's. And so now I have 2a squared minus 3a plus 1. So this is the first time we saw not numbers in the x place. So here we have an a. It doesn't matter if it's a number or a letter or whatever. Uh, just replace the x's with whatever is here. That's going to be important for where we're headed, right? So that's just going to be that. Oops, I erased things. Silly me. All right. Um, now we're going to do a little bit of a quick review. We're going to pick back up with that function g in a minute. But we're going to talk about foiling. All right. So uh, when I think about foiling, I actually think of it as glorified distribution. All it is is just distribution. All right. So foil, you, teacher, you might have had a teacher or instructor previously made a big deal about the acronym. First, outer, inner, last. I remember being an eighth grader in Algebra 1, being confused out of my mind, and like, why are, why am I doing following this acronym, first, outer, inner, last? Now my teacher might have explained it to me, and I just wasn't paying attention, and then it just became use as acronym, but I had the hardest time with this acronym. Once I realized, oh, this is just distribution. Oh, I can distribute. It's just a funny way of writing it. Uh, it became cake. All right, so... Let's take a look at A. So if I have, uh, this is x plus 2, both of those, times x minus 6. So you might have, like I said, had a teacher who was like, do first, and then do outer, and then inner, and then last. Sure, if you're good with it and you like it, do it. But FOIL, the acronyms, that acronym is going to fail when you're going to do something like this. So that's why I like to think of it as um, glorified distribution. So 
Whenever I have a paper, physical paper, I will physically cover up that plus two. Here, I'll just draw over it. Um, so we have, if I just saw x times x minus six, everyone watching this video should be able to distribute that. This is x times x, x times negative six. All right, I have it written over here. All right, so x times x is x squared, and x times negative six is negative six x. All right, are we okay with that purple part? I guess I'm asking questions and you can't get feedback. Bunch of the nature. Habits to break. All right. So um, once you're once you're done with once you're uh, distributed as far as you can, we move on to the next one. So I'm going to cover up this x. So I'm just going to look at this two. I'm going to distribute this two as much as I can into the parentheses. So we have uh, two times x and two times negative six, which is what's happening over here. So then uh, I have two times x is two x and two times negative six is negative 12. And there we go, we just foiled. Notice when I distributed uh, the x, uh, distributed the x, that's the first in the outer. When I distributed uh, the, the two, that's the inner and the last. This is the last time I'm gonna talk, say first, outer, inner, last, but I will quite often say, oh, just foil it, meaning this process. So I'm okay with referring to foil and I'll use it often uh, for meaning distribute but I'm not going to actually think of those the acronyms. So then combine like terms, negative 6 plus 2x is a negative 4. So this distributes, multiplies into this. Okay, so using what I just told you and what I mentioned about squares back on, I think it was uh, letter letter A, I'm sorry, letter B on, the, on uh, the previous part, I want you to do this one, All right? So what is uh, 2x plus 3? All that squared. Pause the video, try this one on your own. How are you doing so far? Now, uh, you might have finished, probably, because you didn't know I was going to just give you a hint. But I want you to uh, think about this. If you're squaring, what does it mean to square something? It means to multiply it by itself. So what I want you to do, whenever you see a binomial squared, write it twice. Okay? So I have 2x plus 3 squared, right? So now I'm going to have 2x plus 3 times 2x plus 3. Write it twice, multiply. Now you see uh, this is just the same thing that we did up there. We're just going to foil it in that manner, all right? So if you haven't finished, uh, now give it a shot. Okay, so let's see how you did. I'm going to cover up this plus 3, and we're going to distribute. So 2x plus Sorry, 2x times 2x is 4x squared, and 2x times 3 is 6x. We're good with those two. Then, uh, distribute, then I'm going to cover up the 2x and then distribute the 3. 3 times 2x is 6x. Sounds familiar. And 3 times 3 is 9. Um, these two match, and anytime you see a binomial squared, these middle two will always match. So 6x plus 6x is 12x. Now, a little bit of word of warning. Some of you, this, this is why I wanted you to try it on your own first. Some of you uh, need to slap your hand a little bit so you make sure you don't do make this mistake again. You took 2x plus 3 squared and you went, oh, well, well, I can just square that, square the first one, square the second one. No, you may not. All right? You notice if you try that, you're missing this 12x. All right? That 12x is gone. We, uh, in the uh, in the exponential video, we talked about this. So if you're not sure, go back and uh, watch the exponential video. The exponential video I mentioned, if I had, uh, let's say, 2xy and squaring it, yes, I could square the 2, square the x, square the y, and this would be 4x squared, y squared. That's fine. But the minute you stick a plus between, between those two terms, all bets are off. You may not just square the things. All right, you have to write it twice and FOIL. All right, you're going to learn in mathematics that those pluses and mi pluses and minuses are like big old stop signs. They stop you from doing the nice, convenient things. All right, I'm not going to spend much time talking about C. Just the idea that to FOIL this, um, I'm going to just look at this first term. The others are dead to me. Don't care how many or what they are. And then, and then, and then I'm going to distribute this x. Into many, into as many terms as there are in the uh, in the other uh, polynomial. So I'm going to multiply those three together, and we get this. 
then I'm going to just look at the minus y. The others have passed out, not worried about them right now. And I'll distribute the negative y into the other three terms. Then uh, I'm going to do, and we get these three terms. Then I'm going to just worry about the 3x, cross out the other ones, cover them up, don't need them. And then I'm going to distribute those. So when I do, I end up with these terms. We then combine like terms and we're done. So foiling the first out inner last would have broken down here. So all you need to do for glorified distribution, what I mean, I would still call this foil, oh, just foil them together. That's that same idea of just this distribution. We um, take the first one and, dis and distribute until you run out of items. Move on to the next one, distribute till you run out of items. Move on to the next one, distribute till you run out of items, and keep doing that until you run out of items in the first uh, first polynomial. All right. So now that we've got that little bit of a review out of the way, let's take a look at this one. So recall our g function. g of x is 2x squared minus 3x plus 1. So now I'm going to evaluate g of a minus b. Now before that review, I had you find what g of a was, and we just replaced the x with a's. So well now it's g of a minus b. We haven't had a minus uh, in there yet, but why would I do anything different? I'm not. So instead of uh, an x's, I'm just going to write a minus b's everywhere we had an x. So I'm going to do that. And oh, lo and behold, I have this square right here. What do I do when I see a binomial squared? You write it twice and foil right? until this becomes natural to you and uh, you won't mess it up every time. I want to see you write it twice. Anytime you see a binomial squared, I want you to write it twice and foil until you can prove to me that you're a pro at it. All right. So then we foil uh, and we end up with uh, a squared minus ab minus ab plus b squared. I've gone ahead and distributed this negative 3 and ended up with negative 3a plus 3b and the 1 has just followed down. Again, notice anytime I do a binomial squared, the middle two terms are the same. This is not a coincidence and I'll show you why in just a second. Um, so we end up with negative 2ab and then I can distribute this 2 to finish this out. Notice I did not take this 2 and distribute in before we squared. Order of operations still reigns supreme here. We have to square first. All right, so then we uh, distribute and nothing is actually like terms. So yeah, we're done with that one. So uh, remember again, uh, you cannot just uh, square the items. That is a big O fell. We cannot do that. You have to write it twice in foil. Notice on this same page of notes, I have two sets of warnings about the same error. Do you think this is a big deal? It is. Make sure that we're good about, about those distributions. One other thing just about vocab term. We call these things perfect squared trinomials. What are the things? This trinomial. These three terms is called a perfect square trinomial. Later, we're going to be talking about factoring. Later, much, much later, several, uh, several days, lectures away. We, we'll be uh, reviewing factoring. Um, with factoring, this is a trinomial. It will factor into this. That's because this will multiply into that. So it's a perfect squared trinomial. Um, if you were to write this twice in FOIL, you would end up with a squared plus ab plus ab plus b squared. So I don't care what the a or the b is, are, that you'll always end up, those middle two terms will always be the same. So we can just basically really double. So if you're um, capable, this is after showing me that you know how to do this, you are able just to kind of jump like this um, and use that formula. You take the first item, square it, multiply them together, double, Take the last item, square it. If it's a negative in the middle, same thing. It's just that we're going to end up with a negative uh, here in the for the middle term because when you multiply them together, they're negative. Double them, still negative. But if I square a negative, it's now positive. So there's a bit of a formula here if you're a formula type person. But uh, until you get good at it, I want you to, anytime you see a binomial squared, write it twice, then FOIL. All right, so practice it uh, with this one. So same uh, using our same g of 
g of x, uh, find g of x plus h, where h is just some constant. Pause the video, try that one on your own. All right, welcome back. Let's see how you did. So this is very similar to what we just did with the a minus b. Might even be easier because it's a plus. Uh, so same thing. So uh, x plus h in, into both x's. Uh, then we square it. That means write it twice. Write it twice. Write it twice. And then foil. Uh, we end up with two x x h's in the middle. So we get uh, x squared plus two x h plus h squared. Then we multiply them by two. Uh, and then over here we had this negative three that we distributed, and that and that along with the plus one followed down, and nothing combined. All right. Uh, notice how I'm showing my work over here. Uh, this is very important. Uh, I have uh, explanations for each of these steps. I, I'm really wanting, especially here at the beginning of this course, I'm really wanting these explanations. And here's why. Because if you can write down in words explaining what you're doing, um, then more likely it's right. Right? Students will just sometimes go, um, I'm just going to do what looks right. I don't, I don't really know if it is right. No, no. Math, math is all about uh, basically following the rules. You can do whatever you want to in math as long as it's legal. So here you're justifying what I'm doing is legal and here's what I'm doing. All right? If it's not a legal maneuver, then you can't do it. All right? Also, just things that are just uh, helpful and convenient is that I have my equal signs here. They're all lined up. And so what this is saying is this is g of x plus h equals this, which equals this, which equals this, which equals this, which equals this. So that means that g of x plus h equals this, what's in this box. All right? Sometimes I will write, just for clarity, uh, the, the what I started with on the left-hand side here. Uh, but these equal signs are a little bit non-negotiable. It's a good idea to have those uh, when you're starting with, with some sort of equality statement like that. All right, so I'm expecting nice, clear work like this. Uh, if you need to have a decent amount of lines in between, cool, go for it. Um, it needs to be legible, neat, and organized. Especially because you'll see that these... Uh, today's lecture, uh, I'm getting into the... Um, the most extreme sort of kind of hardest part of function notation. So this notation is, needs to be uh, clean. Uh, not hardest, just weedy. Okay, um, so let's take a look at this one. g of x plus h minus g of x. So this minus g of x here, well, g of x is just g of x, right? And g of x plus h, that's just g of x plus h, what we just found. So, yeah, good news right here is that we know those two items. All this is saying is subtract them. So g of x plus h, that's this. I'm just going to copy it down. Oh, look, I did. And g of x, that's just uh, 2x squared minus 3x plus 1. But do notice I have a subtraction here, and I have parentheses. These parentheses are non-negotiable. If you don't include those parentheses, you could, you could also use a square bracket if you think those look better, and I do that sometimes uh, in this notes, uh, in these notes. Uh, these, these parentheses are non-negotiable because in the, our next step is to be distributing that negative to these three terms. If you don't, then you are just saying it's a minus 2x, and these others don't change sign, and that is incorrect. All right, so make sure to put parentheses. These parentheses here, uh, the ones in the front, not really needed. Uh, just sometimes it might be helpful for you to see them grouped up, that they all kind of came together in as a unit. All right, so I'm going to distribute the negative, and we end up with this. And then I just, for clarity, rewrote because I was about to start crossing through things, because if you notice, we have a 2x squared and a negative 2x squared. So I wanted to make sure that this line is clear, that we distributed, and then now we're going to be crossing through things because they're going to be canceling to zero. So, like I said, negative 2x, positive 2x squared, bye-bye, they go to zero. Uh, negative 3x and a positive 3x, bye-bye, they go to zero. And plus 1, minus 1, bye-bye, they go to zero. So we end up with 4xh plus 2h squared minus 3h. You're probably going, 
Mr. Leach, you're picking some really weird things for us to do here. I know, there's a method to the madness. Just wait. Okay, uh, last one uh, for this, and we'll, we'll see the big reveal. So we're going to have g of, g of x plus h minus g of x divided by h. So notice this numerator is what we just did. And then I'm dividing by h. Okay, so I'm just going to take this, stick it in my numerator, and then going to divide by h. All right, if you notice, everything in this numerator has an h in it. Since everything in the numerator has an h in it, I can just factor out an h from the numerator. So you have an h, factor u out, factor u out, factor u out. Okay, this is basically factoring, factoring out a GCF. So I factor out an H. Um, whenever you do factor out a GCF, I generally would advise you to, uh, in your head mentally, just distribute it back just to make sure that you did that right. So what is H times 4X? Well, it's 4XH. What is H times 2H? Well, H times H is H squared times that 2 would be 2H squared. And what's H times negative 3? Negative 3H. So yeah, we did that right. Right, me, your professor, the masters of mathematics. Every time I, I, I pull out the GCF, I typically just do a quick mental distribution to make sure that I did that right. All right, then I've just rewritten it for clarity because I'm about to cross through things. Uh, and notice I have an H divided by H. Well, H divided by H is one, so that reduces to one. Just notice uh, what I'm saying. This, re this reduces to one. These items up here, they canceled to zero. I'm going to be a little bit picky about that terminology. Things cancel to zero, but they reduce to one. All right. Um, that's because this is just, this ends up being one times this, which is just what's left in the parentheses. All right. So we have 4x plus 2h minus 3. Now you might be saying to yourself, come now, Mr. Leach, what's all this mess for? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. This thing is called the difference quotient. You just did it, right? In these, those three steps, um, you just performed what's called the difference quotient. So the difference quotient is this formula. It is uh, f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h with just a technical note that h is not zero. Now, this is basically kind of the extreme of function notation. This is just a cool application that you, with the knowledge of function notations, are able to do and able to comprehend. Just a little bit of just a math note about um, the, the difference quotient. The formula computes the slope of the secant line through two points uh, on the graph F. Uh, these are points with X coordinates uh, and the X plus H. So the difference quotient is used day one in calculus. You're like, well, I'm not in calculus right now. No, but some of you might be. So just the secant line. So if I have some function uh, some function like that and the secant line is a line that goes through two specific points so what I'm saying is that this is that what we just found is the slope of that line that line changes slope throughout depending on X and H um, so it's a pretty big deal literally day one calculus you'll be talking about this but you have knowledge to you, you have enough knowledge to be able to sit in and survive in day one of calculus kind of neat all right, so the, there are three steps uh, for doing this. Now, you could just do it, find it, find uh, f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. But it's going to be easier, in my experience, to do this in chunks. So first, find this smallest chunk up top, find f of x plus h. Then, once you find that, then subtract f of x. Then, take all that numerator and divide by h. So that's what we did up here. Um, so first we found g of x plus h. Then we subtracted g of x from, uh, from that first one. And then we divided by h. So uh, just to be clear, uh, the difference quotient for g of x is this 4x plus 2h minus 3. Okay, so we uh, previously we talked about f of x. So f of x is negative 2x plus 5. The difference, so let's find the difference quotient for f of x. I often have you pause the video and uh, try the problem on your own. 
but even like on this one i'm not going to have you do this as you can see the work is uncovered um, but if you want to have a challenge and go ahead and, and try things on your own that's something you can always do so uh, you can always pause it cover it up and then try to work it on your own even if i don't think that that's one that i'm going to uh, kind of make you do so make, remember that you always have that freedom it's one of the beauty, beauty uh, things about having these uh, these lectures online so um, we're going to go back to our function f uh, and then with this function, we're going to have you do the do the difference quotient. Uh, I'm not telling you what to do. We're just saying do the difference quotient. That automatically means do those three steps. What is f of x plus h? What is f of x plus h minus f of x? And then what is all that divided by h? So step one, what is f of x plus h? So we have negative two. Uh, then instead of x, I'm going to write x plus h and then the plus five. Notice we have the parentheses there that is non-negotiable because we're going to need to distribute that negative 2 onto both of those terms. Negative 2 times x is negative 2x. Negative 2 times h is negative 2h. And that's that. So that's as far as we can simplify. Let's move on. So now we have, we're going to now minus f of x from what we just found. So I'm going to minus f of x. Make sure we, again, put parentheses here because I'm going to have to distribute that negative. So now it's a positive 2x and then a minus 5. And then I rewrote just for clarity because uh, then notice things are going to uh, cancel to 0. Negative 2x plus 2x cancels to 0. Plus 5 minus 5 cancels to 0. Look at this note here. When finding the difference quotient, uh, every term that does not have an h should cancel to 0 at this step. This is not a coincidence. It happened when we, were, when we worked uh, letter G, function G. It's going to work here. In my next video, we're, we're going to be covering more problems, more examples. It's going to be doing the same thing at this step. Anything that does not have an H should disappear. Uh, so then all we're left with is negative 2H. And then the last step uh, is now is to find, uh, is to divide by H. So uh, I might take my numerator and then divide it by H h is reduced to 1 and we're left with just negative 2. So again because everything had an h left over sorry everything here has an h in it and then we just divided by h that means when finding the difference quotient h should reduce to 1 in that step pretty much every time. And then what's the slope of f of x just a little question to think about so f of x let me zoom out here f of x is negative 2x plus 5. What's the slope of that function? That's a line, right? The slope is negative 2. What's, what is this? Recall I said that, that the difference quotient is the slope of a secant line. Well, if I have this line uh, passing through um, positive 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, with a slope of negative 2, something about like that, and I pick any two points on this line and draw a line through it, I'm going to get that same line that has a slope of negative 2. All right. Um, so we are getting the slope uh, of, of this line in, of, of a bunch of lines, uh, and you can see that expressed here. All right. In my next video, I have three other, I don't know, several other functions uh, that we're going to be covering. Uh, there's just more examples. In there, you're going to see uh, square root functions, rational functions, that's where the x is in the denominator, and then just some more like this that are linear and quadratic. So I'll see you in the next video.